All right, YouTube. Today we're gonna do a problem which is typically done using a train, but I just don't have room on my page for a whole train. So we're gonna do this problem with a little bicycle instead. And the problem typically goes like this. The bike can accelerate from rest at one meter per second squared and slow back down at two meters per second squared. And we're trying to solve for the minimum time it's gonna take our little dude on a bicycle to travel a set distance. In this case, 100 meters. So what I wanna do is graph the velocity versus time of our little dude on a bicycle as he's riding along. Now our little guy is gonna start at rest and accelerate forward at one meter per second squared. So on our graph, we're gonna see a diagonal line or a steady increase in velocity as he speeds up. Then after a certain amount of time, and we don't know how much time that is, he's gonna to have to hit the brakes and slow down to rest. So on our graph, we're gonna see suddenly the velocity starts decreasing with a slope of negative two meters per second squared. And it's using this graph of velocity versus time that we're gonna be able to generate a system of equations that we can use to solve this problem. Now the motion of our dude on a bike can be broken up into two phases. The first phase where he's speeding up and the second where he's slowing down. Now we don't know how long either of those phases are gonna take, so let's just say this phase one is gonna take some time T1, and it makes sense to call that second phase a total time of T2. Now from looking at the graph, we can see the total time our little dude spends riding is gonna be the time for phase one plus the time for phase two, which leads us to our first equation, T1 plus T2 equals the total time. And we'll call that equation one in our little system of equations that we're gonna generate. Now going back to our graph, You'll notice this peak right here, which is the point where our little dude transitions from trying to speed up to hitting the brakes and slowing down. And that point is the maximum velocity at which the bicycle is ever going to travel. And we can use that maximum velocity to set up our next equation. You see, the maximum velocity is equal to the final velocity of the first phase of motion. So we'll call that VF1 but it's also equal to the initial velocity in the second phase of motion. We'll call that VI2. So now we're gonna apply the kinematic equations to each phase of motion independently. So using the equation VF equals VI plus AT, applying that equation just to the first phase of motion, we're gonna get VF1 is equal to zero, that's the initial velocity, plus A1, which is one, but like I said, I'm gonna leave it as a variable, times t1, which we don't know, leaving us with an expression that relates the final velocity to the acceleration in time over that first phase. And we can do the same thing with the second phase of motion using the same kinematic equation. In the second phase of motion, the final velocity is gonna be zero. Now the initial velocity, we don't know, we're just gonna call it vi2, and the bike's gonna be slowing down at some rate a2 for a time t2. Now it's important to realize that this acceleration is in the negative direction. So we're gonna drop our negative in here right now. But as we continue on and create an expression for VI2, you'll see that negative goes away, even though we already accounted for it. Now the final velocity from the first phase is equal to the initial velocity from the second phase. So setting these expressions equal to each other, we'll get our second equation that we're gonna to use to solve this problem. Now going back to our graph, you'll notice these values A1, T1, or A2, T2 are actually the maximum magnitude or height on our velocity versus time graph. So we've used both time and acceleration to generate equations, but we haven't used the displacement that was given in the problem. So going back to the graph, the area under the curve of a velocity versus time graph is equal to displacement. So looking just at the first phase of motion, the area under the curve during the first phase is the displacement during the first phase of motion. And the area under the curve during the second phase of motion is gonna be the displacement over that second phase. And from that, we can say the displacement over the first phase plus the displacement over the second phase is gonna equal the total displacement in the entire problem. Which gives us the third equation, which I'm gonna call, you guessed it, equation three. Now, much like we did up here with our equation for velocity, I'm gonna apply the displacement equation to each of the phases of motion. So D1 is equal to the initial velocity, that's zero times T plus one half A1 T1 squared. Now moving on to the displacement for phase two, again, we're using the displacement equation, 
But the issue comes up in dealing with negatives. You see, d2 is equal to the initial velocity, which is not going to be zero. So we're just going to call it v initial in phase one, multiplied by time one plus one half a one t two squared. Oh, geez, I screwed that up. That should be a two t two. Now going back to the graph, the initial velocity has a magnitude of a two t two. All right, writing this out correctly, we got d two is equal to a two t two plus one half a two t two squared. And you've got to be really careful with the negative here. You see, we already applied the negative to the a two t two as a part of the initial velocity, but we haven't dealt with the negative in our one half a t squared term. So combining these terms, we come up with one half a two t two squared. Now this may be a bit confusing, partially because I screwed up the subscripts, but if you look at the graph, you'll notice the base of the graph has a width of t two and the height is a two t two. So the area under the curve is going to be one half a two t two times t two. This is just starting to sound silly, but that's what's happening. So now we're going to take our two displacement terms and substitute them into equation three, giving us an equation with only two unknowns, our times. And you guessed it. I'm going to call this one equation four. So now we're going to solve for one of the times. How about t1 using just equations two and four? You see, if we rearrange equation two, we get this expression. And subbing that rearrangement into equation four, things start to get a little ugly. But don't worry, we can clean this up and solve for t1. So whether the problem you have is a train out of some physics book somewhere, or you're just doing this for fun, we can now plug the numbers from the problem into this expression. And we find our little biker guy is going to need to spend 11.5 seconds speeding up. And plugging that time back into equation two, we can now solve for time two, which we find is 5.77 seconds. So knowing the times from the two phases of motion, we can go back up to equation one and solve for the total time it's going to take our little dude to travel these 100 meters. And we find the shortest time our little guy can make this trip in is 17.3 seconds. So ultimately we generated a graph that we used to set up a system of equations to solve for our different times. So I hope you found this useful. And on that note, that's all for now.